because humans, we still have that monster in us, you know, that it probably comes from our entanglement with the Neanderthal. That's another whole long story, but we're finding out a lot about the Neanderthal and how they interbred with Homo sapiens and, um, it gives us a lot of our aggressive tendencies, but we do have the ability to stop that monster, to evolve out of it, but it, it's a choice. Yeah. It is. And we just need to stop being angry. We need to stop being judgmental and sticking our heels in and, and listen to someone else's perspective. Even if you, you don't agree with it, but you listen anyway, and you hope that they'll listen to you and then we'll reach common ground. Yeah. And we're good at it. Welcome to the Viva Frequency, home to conversations with consciousness. I'm Biba, your host. Hey folks, it's Biba here. It's late at night. I've just had an amazing interview with a gentleman called Steve Neal. Steve has a YouTube channel called Breaking the Silence and all the bits and bobs will be in the description below. He's a he's an incredible artist and he's an experiencer. He's been having encounters with interdimensional beings. He calls them the visitors his entire life and it runs in both his mother's side and his family's side. He's a filmmaker. He is a storyteller. He's an incredible artist. He has been documenting encounters through his own experiences and also listening to Yvonne Smith, the regression therapist and her client sessions. And he's got a whole, um, he's got a whole bunch of art to just, just to really show you, to show you what's his world and how it is. And talking to him and watching his movies on his YouTube channel has really opened up my awareness to this phenomena and this uh, reality that so many people live in. I really, really recommend you check out his YouTube channel and I recommend you listen to a couple of the stories of his guests and he makes movies on those stories, mini movies. So it's very immersive. And in this uh, interview, he's very tender and kind and he shares some of the story and just a little bit about who he is and how his encounters with the phenomena and these um, interdimensional beings has shaped his reality and shaped his life into what he is today and who he is today. So sit back and enjoy. Hey, Steve, welcome to the Bieber Frequency podcast. Thanks so much for having me here. Um, yeah. I've watched some of your, your podcasts and, uh, and I've also looked at your art and I really love your art. And I love your art. Your art is very very special. It's it's like your art's documenting history, really, isn't it? In a way. It's it's all over the map though. I mean I I do other forms of art besides the the stuff with the visitors. Um, you know, sometimes I just I just do a painting of someone standing in an open field with his arms up to the sky, which I did recently and um yeah. I will I will do very sort of impressionistic and photoreal type art. So I'm all over the map and I'm a sculptor. And, yeah. And special effects. Right. Yeah. It's lots of special effects. So for years Brilliant. and years and years and years, and I'm glad I did it, but I don't miss it. The, so tell us a little bit about, tell the audience here in Ireland and in Europe a little bit about Steve Neal. It's hard to know where to begin, except when I was a kid, I loved science fiction and horror and, and uh, astronomy and telescopes and, anything had to do with space and anything had to do with ghosts and all that kind of stuff. I was interested day one. And it led to a, a career in Hollywood after I got out of high school, because I worked with uh, Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, and um, got to work on a number of his projects, which was an incredible experience. And then for the rest of my career, I did... Um, well, besides doing Mr. Spock's ears and aliens for Star Trek, I did lots of other creatures and and um, aliens and monsters and horror stuff for film. But I also did acting as well, where I'd play gorillas and I'd play aliens in movies. Because I was a special makeup effects artist, I also was a Screen Actors Guild member and I was an actor and I had been acting. Um, so I combined the two. Um, but all the time I wanted to make films. The, the film that influenced me the most was 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, Stanley Kubrick uh, was a huge hero to me and a mentor and still is to this day. Um, and 2001 
was such an amazing movie that has so much to do with my interest um, in The Visitors, because really it's the greatest movie ever made about The Visitors, if you really think about it. I mean, you, you have this 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 uh, non-human intelligence present on Earth in the early development years of our hominids, uh, Australopithecus. Um, in the way the film starts, you get the feeling that they're not going to survive, and then the monolith appears, and then they learn how to use tools, and they learn how to kill each other, and they learn how to get meat. <laughs> And then, of course, the bone gets thrown into the air in and, and, and that sequence, and it tumbles in the sky. And it became what everybody thought was a spaceship, but actually it was a nu nuclear orbiting platform bomb. Um, and, of course, that led to us getting to the moon, and we discovered another monolith. The non-human intelligence there knew that if we got to the moon, that we'd find it. And if we found it, it was time to take another look at what they had begun but they had started on Earth all those millions of years ago. Um, and of course, that led us to Jupiter, which led us to another monolith, and that took Dave Bowman. Um, and then they took us to the next step. And of course, the movie ends with this very large-headed baby, which I recreated uh, for Adam Savage and myself. Um, but that was called The Star Child, and... It was basically a hybrided human being that would come to Earth and start to change us again, hopefully not to be so warlike and be a bit more uh, constructive uh, instead of destructive. So that film, you know, just mesmerized me. Uh, I was in high school, you know, in, in 1968 when it came out. It's just changed my life. Wow. So that was the greatest influence on me as an artist. Yeah, well, Stanley Kubrick, you know, and the thing about him is he was a very he his movies really were very real. They were like documentaries, really, weren't they? Like um, Eyes yeah. Wide Shut and um, two thousand and one in in a movie way. It's like this is a movie, but it's not really. Full Metal Jacket, um, yeah, Blackbird Orange. My my goodness, you know, it just. Uh... And it's amazing. I, I never got to meet him. I mean, I started when I first got to high school, I started working at the American Zoetrope. I met Francis Ford Coppola and became friends with him. And I got my start there. Wow. And there's always talk about Stanley coming into town and he was going to come in town. And instead, he sent off to see Clarkin on his behalf because they were going to do Childhood's End. So author showed up there. I got to meet him, but um, never got to meet Kubrick. Years later, I became friends with Gary Lockwood, who played uh, Dave um, Frank Poole in 2001. He's the astronaut that Hal unfortunately killed. Uh, we became friends. He used to come over here all the time and hang out. It was a lot of fun to be around. He told so many stories about Kubrick. He absolutely <laughs> adored Kubrick and the film. Wow. Uh, it was the greatest thing he ever did. In fact, we, he was on our podcast. But not only did he come over here, the man who played Moonwatcher, the lead character hominid in the Ope Donna Man sequence, uh, came here. And he actually wore uh, a recreation I did of the Moonwatcher uh, prosthetic wow. mask that was used. <laughs> that was really something. And so wow. everywhere I went, I mean, I, I ran into Sue Lyon, who worked with him on, on Lolita. And everywhere I went in my career, I ran into people that knew Stanley. So by this point in my life, I feel like I do know him because they were so personal about him. So it was really something. That is, it's incredible, your story. And you're a filmmaker and you've written books and you've had your own experiences and you're an artist. Sure. So your your whole life is like a montage of um, otherworldly experiences, really, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah just my whole career in, in Hollywood was unworldly. I mean, just the people I got to know and work with and, um, you know, doing Leonard Nimoy's ears to play Mr. Spock, which was just a big deal for me because, you know, I, in high school, I used to imagine what it might be like to come to Hollywood and meet Leonard Nimoy and William Shatner oh. and work with Gene Roddenberry. And then I did it. Yeah. It actually happened. So yeah. that was <laughs> just astounding. But all during that time, 
I never talked about the things that happened in the night. I kept it from my family and I kept it from my friends. And the only person I talked to about it was my grandfather, who was from Ireland, Grandfather Neil. Um, and he had a lot of experience with the paranormal. I mean, what we call the paranormal. I don't call it the paranormal. I call it normal, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but they had to put a label on it. Um, I had a, a experience with him where I saw a large ball. If you watch my film, mm -hmm. um, but something is there. There's this large sort of fireball that came and hovered over us. I mean, hovered and, and sat there and, and I could feel a life from it. We saw ghosts together. I mean, honest to God, shimmering humanoid ghost of a man who had fallen down a well right next to the property on this open field where my grandmother's house was. Wow. He told me about his experiences in Ireland and he, he claimed that he saw little people. Now, of course, the first thing anyone's going to think of is the leprechauns. And um, that's not what he meant, as it turned out. He called wow. them little people. Um, he also heard the wail of the banshee which is interesting and, and, but my grandmother used to make fun of him. And that's, there's a whole scene in my film where um, I had been outside with him when we saw the large, uh, the large orb ball um, that shot off very quickly afterwards. And she got real mad at him because she thought that I was, you know, she just saw a meteor in your grandfather's sees all kinds of things. He even sees a leprechaun's right grandfather. And she, she called him, you know, um, and I felt bad because I knew he was telling me the truth. So it runs in my family and it turned out towards uh, the end of my mother's life. It was on her side as well because she finally opened up to me about it. Wow. And, and yeah, just the last couple of years of her life and, and just told Gosh. me things that, that just, uh, they really, I don't know if they shock me, but they really, they really move me because whenever I would see a UFO when I was a kid and I'd tell her about it, she'd just ignore me or poo poo it. Um, almost have an edge to her about it. But in the end, you know, I remember she said, I've seen you on all those television programs with that guy. She met Whitley Strieber, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was like, oh, boy, here we go. Now I'm going to get a lecture about that. And she says, oh, no, 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 I believe you. And then she opened up and Gosh. she told me about experience she had with my grandmother that was just uh, amazing. So they were sitting on the porch. She lived out in the countryside in Rin County. She had a, a small ranch out there with llamas on it, of all things, and Shetland sheepdogs. Mm. And they're sitting on the porch, and it's a very dark sky, and there's lots of stars, except that there was this black circle moving across the stars. They could, she said, I could see it because there was an absence of stars, and it kept coming closer and closer, and um, then a light started to come out of it from the middle. And as it got closer, it shined at them, my grandmother and my mother. And they sat there on the porch looking at that for a bit. And it's shining light more and more. And as she described it to me, she says, um, you know, we, we felt we needed to go in the house. You know, it was kind of bothering them and worrying them. What is this? And they go in the house. The lights come through the windows and follow them in, basically, and shining on them. And then she just went silent. So I said, so, Mom, what happened next? There's a long pause, and she said, you know, I really don't know. I don't remember. So this is very typical, as you well know. Yeah. You hear this time and time again. So so it, it definitely ran in the family on both sides. And when your mother finally just really acknowledged your experiences and mirrored them with her own experiences, what was that like for you? Well, I, I felt at that moment that any chance I had of being crazy and just thinking it was all in my head was, was gone forever. <laughs> so yeah, it's just beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I just knew there's no reason that she would do that because she was a very practical, very intelligent woman and uh very stiffer up lip. I think the, 
you know, she was raised in a Russian family. And so there was a lot of Russian go attitude going on there. Um, so it was very striking. I knew she wasn't lying to me. I knew she was being truthful. And I knew that it kind of confirmed for me, besides going under hypnosis and, and working with uh, people investigating this phenomenon and uh, they're assuring me that these things were happening to me. It wasn't enough, but that, that kind of did it. I mean, I've seen, I've seen the beings not dreaming and not half asleep, but fully awake in the middle of the night in my house, uh, face to face. And even that's not enough. It really isn't. It's funny because your mind keeps telling you that, this can't be real. You need to be skeptical. You need to uh, get a grip on yourself. Uh, and you just hope that it's not something else like that you're having, uh, you, you know, schizophrenic or something like a lot of people are afraid of that temporal lobe problems, and, but um, no, that wasn't it. So, and then of course, as time went on too, with my late wife, she was terrified of this stuff and wanted me not to be involved in it. And, but then when she started to see the same things, um, you know, she accused me of, of having such an influence on her that it was, she was hallucinating. She didn't want to believe her own eyes, you know? So it, it was really, really hard. I mean, I had to get out of, by, two, by 2000, I had to leave the UFO community, but I stayed in touch with Whitley and I stayed in touch with Roger Lear and I stayed in touch with Yvonne Smith and some of the other researchers and people working with it because they're my friends and my close friends. But she uh, wanted me out, not on television anymore, not talking about it, take down the website, get rid of the art, everything, um, or I'll leave you. And this is also another typical thing that happens. And it was hard. It's hard. So, you know, and after she passed away in 2013, I started to, um, I figured, well, there's nothing to hold me back now. I'm a lot older now, and, uh, you know, who's going to pester me? Because I was pestered <laughs> before. I was you know, stalked wow. and helicopters and mail sent back and phone taps and threats from the CIA, NSA, all that stuff you hear about. It all happened to me. And, um, and even that I didn't think was real until I started getting phone calls from the motion picture studios I worked for saying that these strange people came in with very official ID saying that it wasn't in their best interest to keep working with me, that I was in trouble with the law. And then how I found this out is one of the studios called me. One of the people there I know, I said, Steve, are you, are you in trouble? I mean, fed, federal, you know, felony type crime. And I said, no, 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 not at all. Why? Well, these people came in and they were in suits and they had ID badges. And, you know, this is like right out of the X-Files. Yeah. Actually, the X-Files is right out of this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I worked on the X-Files briefly and I knew Chris Carter, who was a very, very nice, sweet man. And really, X-Files was based on a lot of real events so yeah he was very into it and that's people like yourself you've made lots of movies and mini movies and stories about times in your life like i've watched i think i've watched all of them and each video is a different perspective of your reality of your experience and it's just there's you hear one thing and you go wow how does somebody really digest that and then you hear the other one which is the military stuff and the helicopters and the neighbors and you know, and your wife, who's just like, stop this, please. Yeah. And then you're probably thinking, how do I stop this? Like, how? No, you don't. Do you have any brothers or sisters? No, no. No. Okay, so you'd know when to bounce off, you see. So you couldn't say to your brother, hey, did you see the... Um... No, I was careful. I kept it to myself as much as possible. So I, I really, I don't remember ever even telling a close friend about it, so... You were six, so this was like your life. Yeah. You were very young when you had your first experience. It's your whole life. It actually goes back further than that, too, though, because I do yeah. have memories of being in my crib, and I did a piece of art for that, and um, of a uh, one of the beings looking into the crib, 
at me. And uh, I'm not alone in that. It goes back really far. So, Yeah, so they've always been there. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I still, I don't know 100% what I'm dealing with. Just that it's the spirit, this intelligence, and it seems to be trying to teach us something. To quote Jacques Vallée, who I have a lot of uh, respect for. Yeah, Jacques Vallée. If you haven't read his books or watched the videos on him on YouTube, where he's been at universities talking about this stuff, he's probably the only person they allowed to do a TED Talk about this stuff. Um, because uh, Ted turned down Whitley Strieber. I guess mm -hmm. they figured he was too far out to the, you know, in the fringe for them. Plus, he's not a PhD. He's not a doctor. And Jacques Vallée, of course, the doctor in um, Close Encounters of a Third Time, the, the French doctor, Lacombe, um, is based on him. Because Spielberg... Uh, knows Jacques, worked with Jacques as well as Dr. Jalen Hynek. Um, and Jacques, Jacques amazing. He, he's, he's probably the only person that's hit the nail in the head about this whole um, subject matter, because going back 2,500 years or more, there's documentation of human encounters with Everything from leprechauns to gnomes to ghost spirits. Yeah. Whatever at that period in time in that culture was appropriate to match their current perspective, that's what they got. But the, so they saw um, demons or they saw gremlins or saw this. It's so fairies come forward a bit more and we start seeing uh, objects in the sky, which looks like blimps with wings on them in the 1800s, come forward to the 50s, we start seeing metal ships and beings inside. But the one common denominator that he focused on was the fact that how they affected human lives and how they affected human physiology as well, that people had missing time and they had marks in their bodies and they, um, they would wake up the next day completely feeling ill and droggy and, um, and many, many other categorized effects that he's documented very, very thoroughly that says, basically, this has been the same thing all along. And it, no one knows for sure that the beings with the big black eyes, which people call grays, or there's many, many types. Um, they don't know if that's what they actually look like and they were making themselves look like things that matched our current folklore back then, or if it's the other way around, you know. And then there's the fact that more than likely, there's many, many forms of intelligence that have visited Earth that can get here interdimensionally. They can get here by traveling from one star to another because their technology has reached a point, as in Star Trek, where they're able to go between star systems and, and they would come here. Of course they'd come here um, because it's worlds with life on them have got to be the greatest fascination there is, especially when you're exploring. Um, so there's so many different possibilities and they're all happening simultaneously probably on earth, which makes it even more confusing because, you know, one person will say, I saw tall white aliens. Another person will say they saw grays. Another person will say they saw reptile types. Uh, they will, they see insectoid types, even, things that look like octopus. Um, but always the same thing. It, whatever it is, it seems to be actually there. It is an intelligence. It's not our own. And it's interacting with us. Yeah. And that's kind of all we have. It's magnificent, really. Yeah. It is. And of course, if we knew what it all was about and meant and who they all were and where they were from and everything, it'd be kind of boring, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so mysterious and so it's it's just that reality you're it's constantly cha versions of realities and concepts and perspectives are continuously changing all the time. Yes. That's what I I like that personally. Yeah. Well, most most people think that, you know, this table here is is solid. 
they go through day to day life. They, they, the 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 average person, the the, the bulk of our of our uh, population, although they've had education and they've been taught science and all these things, they're thinking about other things, and, and it's it's hard for people to grasp that this tabletop, which is made out of glass, got my finger on right now, I cannot pass through. I should be able to though, because it's not solid. It's not solid at all. There's so much space between the atoms and between the atoms that make up my finger, they should be able to pass through. The only difference is they're not both, they're not both at the same frequency. And if I was able to adjust my vibration to the same frequency, I could pass through it. Well, that's sounds completely crazy to most people, but actually there's, there's solid truth behind it, I think, or science. And we've seen these beings pass through solid objects. I did when the one I startled one of them in my kitchen and it looked at me for a second and it just went right through the wall and I ran into the living room to see if I could catch it, but it was long gone, but it went through solid material. Um, I've had experiences where they pulled me through solid material, pulled me through walls, pulled me through the ceiling, pulled me through a refrigerator once so I could see what it was like. And they lessened that vibration so I could actually feel the refrigerator tugging at me. And it was really scary because, you wow. know, you've heard about the Philadelphia experiment, and people being trapped in metal. And I think that's what they're doing. They're literally adjusting their frequency vibration to be able to pass through solid material, uh, material that is allegedly is solid, but in actuality yeah. isn't. You know? And and so when 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 they come and they take you, and then you mm. go through the wall with them. So when they're when they take you, then you're in their frequency. So therefore, you can go through the wall. Yeah, I remember uh, the little being had its hand on me when it when it did that. That makes me wonder if they're extending that into my my body to be able to allow me to do that, you know. But it's in, it's always a guess. It's always a guess. And then there's the double slit experiment. And, of course, when particles are observed, they behave differently than when they're unobserved. And that means that our consciousness affects them and changes them, which means that everything in reality is made of particles and atomic structure. So... If by observing them we're changing them, then that means everybody's reality is different. Yeah, and it can be very different and very real for them, and not real possibly for you. So that that makes it difficult. I think it's why we have a lot of problems. It's because we we are all seeing different realities. We're so disconnected from each other that we can't share at least. A common reality, everybody's reality, it's like everybody's religion is better than the next guy's religion. My reality is better than your reality. And then they fight over it and stuff. But we don't have this ability to connect. Some of us do. Through art, music, and films, and dancing, and... Just connecting with, with the spirit of this planet and all the life on it. And then all the life that's in the universe. I mean, it, I do it. I can feel it. It's beautiful. And I noticed, I mean, I t I'm, I'm crazy. I talk to spiders, you know, <laughs> <'Cause> I, <laughs> find them inside, I find them inside, crawl on my wall. And I look, oh, it's a jumping spider. And I ask it to you know, help me with the ants and stuff. And they do. Um, but I don't kill them, you know, like so many people do. It's a spider. It, sure, if it's a black widow, it's something you don't want in your bedroom. You, and you, you don't want to be trying to carefully get it out of the house because they move very quickly. And if you were to get bit by it, it's a problem. It's just trying to defend itself. But predominantly, most of the spiders and insects that get in your home, they're not harmful at all. In fact, they do a lot of good. And um, it, it's important to be able to know the difference between them. Because I, when I was a kid, I, I was into entomology and, and biology, and, and I, I studied you know, I loved reptiles and, and all that stuff. I mean, I had pet lizards. Um, I just loved going out in the back of the garden and just seeing everything back there. And because lived in San Francisco, we had this huge—it was like a park. 
almost wow. in itself. At least it seemed that way. I was pretty gloomy. But <laughs> it was a it was a wonderland, and it was full of life, and 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 I felt very connected to it, and I always have. But I have observed that a lot of people don't, and they will um, step on snails and step on bugs, even when they're outside, just for no reason at all. Then, oh, bug, kill it! I you know. know. It's very strange. Even in the, the, the hardware shop, it's like slug killer. I'm like, why would you do that? I like, don't know. It's, it's, but don't you find that when you said the being of the earth and the being, you can feel it. It's in everything. Everything that's, it's in all the animals and all the plants. And I find that when you have, have had a, a chance to, to see another perspective of a reality, like have an experience, for me, it's been paranormal. It changes your perception and you seem to be much more, everything becomes much more alive and tangible. You become much more awake to things in your environment, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And it, it's, it has a tendency to calm you down. It's very comforting because humans, we still have that monster in us, you know, that it, it probably comes from our entanglement with the Neanderthal. That's another whole long story, but... We're finding out a lot about the Neanderthal and how they interbred with Homo sapiens, and um, it gives us a lot of our aggressive tendencies. But we do have the ability to stop that monster, to evolve out of it. But it, it, it's it's a choice. Yeah, it is, and we just need to stop being angry. We need to stop being judgmental and sticking our heels in, and, and listen to someone else's perspective, even if you. You don't agree with it, but you listen anyway, and you hope that they'll listen to you, and then we'll reach common ground. Yeah. And we're good at it. Listening. We're good at it. I mean, I'm involved in a lot of hobbies, and you know, aviation is one of them, flying airplanes. And you know, it's a, a myriad of people that are involved in that community, and they're from all walks of life. There, there's people on the left, there's people on the right, there's people in the middle, there's people that are Catholics or Christians and Buddhists and they all get along. They never talk about that stuff ever. They're so caught up in the one thing they share, and that's their love of flight, that they never dream of doing that. So I see it like in that. I see it in racing too. The real camaraderie, and and all and in art and all kinds of hobbies and things. And people they 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 put their differences aside. We need to do that all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you've you kind of had to because of your life and how it's gone and how the experiences that you've had, you've had to, I suppose, try to accept your own reality. I, you've because I because I've watched your films and I've listened to your um, live streams. And when you do your live streams, sometimes you share some more of your story. It's so different. You know, people like yourself who've had who've been who've had encounters their whole life and have a an insight into other worlds that most of us don't have access to that or don't remember. You have to really learn to listen to others because you know that there's lots of other things going on we don't know about. Mm -hmm. You just know. Oh yeah, yeah. That famous expression that Jimmy Church always uses: "You don't know what you don't know." So, you know, and if you, if you, if you close your mind, you close it off, you dig your heels in, you, you become judgmental, you're not going to learn. You stop learning. You, you feel that you've learned everything there is to know and reality is this way. And anybody that comes along and says anything different is a threat. And I run into this all through my life. People literally threatened by you. Please tell me um, about when you were doing all your regressions. You've done 30 regressions, haven't you? Something like, like that. It might even be more. I, I like a lot. Track. Okay, you've done yeah, a I lot. Yeah, I did a lot. You know, well, Yvonne and I were friendly, and, and I was uh, doing art for her lectures and for her books, and so we sort of traded, and so I was able to do quite a few of them, and, and I have a lot. I remember most of the times things happened to me, and so I would, um, but I knew there were blank spots. And I was curious if by going into hypnosis, anything more could be brought out. Um, Yvonne's very good at it. Um, there's a lot of people that say that the hypnotherapists will lead you, and some of them do, and that's 
not the right way to do things, but she never did. And, you know, she would take you back to a time, you know, it was, it was Friday night and you were driving down the road and you're there now and tell me what, what you're seeing. Tell me what you're experiencing. She wouldn't say, did you see a, or she wouldn't, she wouldn't do it. She would take you back to a time when you saw a UFO on the road driving home. Sure. She would never do that. She would have purposely avoid saying the word. Um, she would never say, if I said there's somebody in the room, she'd say, can you describe it? She wouldn't say, do you see an alien? Or is it a gray? Or is it a tall white? Or is it a reptile? Never, 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 never. She, she's very professional and she's very careful about that because she wants to get uh, as much as possible accurate information. From your reality. Yeah. And, yeah. and so you, sometimes you would just hit blank walls where you, you, you weren't getting anything at all. And you'd come out and say, I don't know, it's all blocked off. You go back in, you try again. And it almost seems as though they did a really good job of trying to block it, but they weren't always successful. And most of the time I was able to break through and I would remember a lot more. Now, whether or not it was accurate, whether or not it was what really happened, I can't say for sure. To be honest, I, I can't, but it sure felt real. And I remember some pretty amazing things. I mean, it, it when we started, we started back when I was really young and that first experience in the bedroom when the lights came in the window and we didn't get a lot out of that, that I didn't already remember. But as we went into the more recent stuff that was pretty fresh in the 90s, uh, I remembered a, a variety of things from um, being put on tables and having they were they were putting instruments and things and taking skin samples and all this stuff that you hear about. I had uh, needles put in me. I had allegedly implants put in me, which I did find one of them, and it's in my ear and it's still there. You did find out how you got a marking, a triangle mark on your your body, a very precise little triangle. You'd find out under hypnosis, you'd see the tool they used and how they did it. And so there was a certain level of fear there that was uh, excruciating for some people and fascinating for others. And I was sort of the more fascinated type. I would, I would lay there, watch it happen, describe it to Yvonne, and I really wasn't afraid. But then the other thing is that they have an effect on you where they calm you down. But I don't know if they were doing that to me or not. But yeah, you went through a lot of that stuff. And, and then it kind of got to another level. And that was a level of um, tests. They would start showing you things and these, these, these screens that would just kind of float like a window would appear. And they would show you things like they showed me this image of all these, it was like, it was a geometric pattern of little spheres. They were, went on forever. And they described to me that each one of those was a universe and it was, they were multi-universes and this is how it is. And each sphere meets up against another and that's another world. That's another whole universe like this, not a galaxy, an entire universe. And of course today, if that was back in the 90s, so today science is beginning to understand that and they're starting to talk about that very multi-universe theory. Um, they would also do things that's called staging, where they would put you in a situation um, to see how you would behave in it. And so um, I love my dogs. I'm super passionate about them. And I mean, who is it that loves dogs? Um, and this one dog that I loved a great deal. I loved them all. Her name was Puka, <laughs> a mischievous animal spirit, Puka. And I had this experience where I was in my backyard and pouring down rain. Um, this was in uh, Los Angeles area. And the rain was coming in really, really hard. And Puka was in the back and I'm trying to get her in because she's getting all wet and she's playing in it. She doesn't care. And all of a sudden, there's a sinkhole forms, and she starts to go down it. And it starts, I'm, I'm describing it now, it's just affecting me, it's, it's amazing. Um, 
she's starting to go in. And, and my first thought and the only thought I had was to jump right in and get her, to get her out. I didn't even think about my own life. And I did that. Wow. And I jumped in. I felt the mud and everything. And I grabbed her and I kept pushing on her. And she got out. I saw her run and get away. And I felt relieved. But then I realized I couldn't get out and I was sinking down. And as I looked in the pouring rain, there was a guy, a man standing and he was just like a silhouette. And he had um, one of those 1940s hats on, you know, just like in my film, yeah. uh, Pedora. Um, and he had a long trench coat on, um, this long bony figure. And he just turned his head at me and he just looked and pointed at me like that. And I came out of it. Just, it was, it really freaked me out. But what got me was how deadly calm I was saving the dog. Years later, when she was much older and she was starting to have uh, balance problems because she was about 13 years old by this point, and she was walking around by our pool and she fell in. I immediately jumped in. It was during winter. The water, the water temperature was probably 40 degrees. I didn't even think about it. I got in there because she was going, starting to sink under and I got her out and I pushed her out. It was very reminiscent of that. And then I realized that the water was so cold that I was, I was draining my strength to be able to get myself out. Wow. And somehow, I don't know how, I ended up out of the pool. And I was yelling and I was screaming, hoping that the neighbors would hear me or Jilly, Jillian would hear me because she was inside. No one heard me. Um, I remember coming in and she was in the bedroom and I said, didn't you hear me? And she says, you're covered. You're, you're soaking wet. What's going on? The dog was shaking. And I just always wondered, was there some sort of parallel between those two incidences? Because I remembered it immediately. The minute that I went and jumped in, I said, this is just like what happened, except it's water. Um, so they, it's like they're looking for something in you when they do that. And they've done that on a number of different ways. Uh, and then, of course, being in a support group as I was back then, you would hear about this from the other people coming to the support group to talk privately about what happened to them. And you'd hear it over and over again. Um, so that level, I, I kind of look back on it now and I look at it as almost a gauntlet. You know, it starts off being you know, picked up, pulled through the wall, going up into a craft, being put on a table, um, being poked and prodded. Um, uh, lots of things going on, putting implants in, this whole hybrid baby thing, which I also experienced. And, but now, today, not just for me, for just about everybody I know, it's reached a different level again. And this is a level where people are at peace with it. They're at peace with, with the, intelli the non-human intelligence, the visitors, the aliens, whatever you want to call them. And they actually feel like they're family and they have a relationship with them. And they've all become the most loving, connected people I've ever run into. And I've noticed this on uh, our channel. I mean, the channel has only been up, you know, barely a little bit over a month. And it's it formed this community of people that are so amazing. They, they give me such hope for the future of our species because, you know, out of, out of 98% of these individuals who comment and share and support the channel and, and interact and share their stories, they've all becoming friends and connecting with each other. There's only a tiny percentage of people who are mean mm. or broken. And I feel sorry for them because they just, they're so angry and they're so mean and they just, they want to tear you down and, I won't even repeat what some of the things I've seen. I'm sure you can relate to it. I've gotten one of the comments and I just, I just thought, wow, it was, I, I was so fascinated at how, had I had taken it personally, I would have gotten angry, which I just learned you don't take things personally. You learn that, right? Yeah. It's never. No. I just went, wow. Wow. <laughs> like, yeah, I know. Uh, like, okay, that's just a, you just need to go and float over there in your own reality because it's we're 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 
hear clashing here, you know, you need to go on, onto another channel because this is pl not the place for you if it makes you that angry. Yeah, I know. I, I, it's, I, I don't know why they come onto our shows and watch them. They see people loving each other and getting along and having these beautiful experiences and it just enrages them, you know? Yeah. So fascinating. But the thing that gives me so much hope is that overall, the greater percentage of people are such great, beautiful people. And that's what holds so much hope for us. Now, if we can just somehow affect the people running this planet and get to them, because already just, just, I mean, since, since the 60s, Mary says it's been since the 50s, maybe it has been, but I know since the 60s, when I was in high school, we were talking about ending war. We were talking about, we're not taking well enough care of the environment and in the future it's going to lead to things that we can't reverse we talked about climate change in high school and we talked about it in college and, and we kept talking about it and we kept warning them we kept telling what was going to happen and 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 now it is happening and you know they but they still can't take it in I, just where my house was flooded in december 21st waking up at two in the morning stepping in the water in California, uh, in gosh. my house, you know, on flat land, basically. I mean, where it doesn't flood. The rain was so powerful that night. I remember looking out the window and just seeing a, like a waterfall coming off the, off the roof. And I knew it was different. And I knew it was a great deal of rain and, and all at once. And it was, and it, it overwhelmed the infrastructure which also had not been cleaned out, even though they knew the storms were coming. And then this close line started flooding and uh, we started getting rogue waves. And, and all this is related to that. And it's happening all over the world. I mean, there's whole islands disappearing that people lived on for years and years. This coastlines are rising and we see it all the time because we live right on the coast. And so uh, when we're coming over the bridge and the marina, we can see the homes that are built on the marina and they keep their boats there. And 10 years ago, those water levels were much lower down. Now at high tide, they're coming up very close to being level with the sidewalks in front of their homes. Gosh. And they're still not seeing it. Or they'll tell you, oh, that was just a freak storm, Steve. That wasn't climate change. Uh, one guy was saying it's a hundred year storm rainstorm. We had one of those hundred year rainstorms last year too, and it flooded out everything. And this year it got worse. Yeah. So if there's some way we could just reach those people, because unfortunately a lot of those people that need to be reached are the ones that are in power, the ones that make very important decisions that affect us all to ignore climate change, to ignore going to war, to, um, you know, stop producing so much plastic to, to curve um, the greenhouse emissions caused by coal and driving cars. And we just got an electric car and it's wonderful, <laughs> you yeah. know? So it's, uh, it's hard to complain about something if you don't, you know, try to take action, but you know, the darn things are so expensive and uh, yeah. Yeah. But they finally come down enough and you can even buy used ones. They're very reasonable and they work very well. And we've had electric cars, I think, from as early as 1920, hmm. but they just never caught on. And then, of course, they had electric cars come out, what was it, in 80 here in the United States. I think it was called the EV. And it was this old red car that ran on on, on uh, lead acid batteries and it was very successful and so successful that they uh, would only allow you to lease them. And so when the leases were up, they took them all back and they shredded them. Can't have that getting out. So, you know, and so if the, we would have started using electric cars back in the eighties, I would say 90% of the cars on the road will all be electric right now. And it makes a huge difference because when people are sitting on the freeway every day, Bumper to bumper, idling, which is the worst, uh, and a gas car, that's contributing a great deal to the emissions. If all those cars were electric, it wouldn't be happening. Of course, there's, there, there's those that say, yes, but you got to burn coal to power the plants to charge the cars. Well, that may be true to, an ex to, to some degree, 
but still you have eliminated all those gas burning cars off the road you can't tell me that's going to make a huge difference even if because the other coal places that are burning coal to give power they haven't increased much <laughs> you know and they've been around but then you stick all these gas cars out there and now you increase the population and you have the problem we have so but then there's the whole um ufo uap side of things where there's a lot of people who are trying to get that awareness out there because there's no there's you don't need um you know engines then you know when no. that technology is released so there's different people are doing their own part right so there's sure. different people focusing on different things and one of the what i loved about your work is because for anybody who doesn't know steve has a channel called breaking the silence on youtube and it's incredible you make all the movies you interview um, these people who've had these encounters and um, there's live streams and you're you post daily actually you're really active it's a beautiful community pretty, pretty much we have the live stream every friday and every saturday we have a premiere it's either one of our films or it's it's another um person telling their story about their experiences and we're trying to get it so that that can be weekly but it's right now it's just mary myself we have mark sims helping us uh, we don't have a lot of help so, because we don't have any, Mary and I are putting all our own money into this. And so to be able to hire people on top of that, to help us, to make it more streamlined, is just not something we can do. We, it's our hope that uh, we will get support through Patreon and things like that from people who are passionate about the channel. Yeah. Um, so that we have the extra funds we need to be able to do things like that and to be able to get more equipment and then also be able to travel because some people can't make it here. We'd have to go to see them. We can't do that right now. So um, there's a lot of people out there that get that. There's very few that don't. And the few that don't make nasty comments about, you're only doing this for money. It's like, no, we're not doing this for money. We're spending our own money to do this. But the reason we're asking for support is so that we have that buffer, you know, to be able to keep making the shows. Because I don't know how long we can keep doing this on our own money. I yeah. mean, just this building here, I've been here 10 years. And I used to do lots of movie work contracts here and stuff. Now, but now that I'm 71, going to be 72 in March, I'm not getting the jobs anymore. It's just not happening. That part of my career is over with, making monsters and all that kind of stuff for, for movies. So right now, I'm paying for this place and so is Mary. Yeah. Go through our money. And it's, you know, it's a couple of grand a month just for, the, just for this, this building. And there's all the other bills that go with it and uh, computers and lights and cameras and SD cards and gas to it just, it, it's, it's a lot. And you, you yeah. can go through your savings really quickly if you're not careful. So we've been asking for support. Some people have been uh, using buy, buy me a coffee and they'll, they'll buy, you know, like 10 coffees and that kind of stuff because they just want to do a one-time deal. Other people are, uh, you know, just paying $3 a month. And we do have perks, so we do have this Sunday, um, we have our first live stream where people who are at a certain tier can actually do what we're doing right now. Because with, uh, I forget how many, with StreamYard, I can get in at once, but I can probably get in 10, 12 people at one time, and then they, they can talk one-on-one -on -one with me, and uh, I can answer their questions, and I can hear their stories, and... Um, so we're offering perks like that. Brilliant. But what I also want to say about your channel is that you, because you're a special effects artist and you're an artist and you, the music and you, it's, it's visual. So someone will be telling their story mm. and, you know, which is a tender moment, you know, because they're coming out and telling their truth that they may have not really done that before. You, you add, um, you add the it's a movie you have it's like you're watching it i've never seen that before ever i've listened to so many stories and even ndes and you just seem to create movies to these people's stories and that's what makes it so unique because it, it's like yeah exactly you know it makes it realer than somebody just talking it's like exactly that's it We've eliminated the uh, interviewer too, because, you know, you have someone sitting there asking questions and sort of directing the guest 
on what to say. And I've never liked that. Um, I think you need to just put the person in front of the camera and let them tell the story. We have a very minimal crew, so they're not, you know, they don't have all these people staring at them. Um, we keep it very um, cozy and casual. Uh, as far as the visuals are concerned, well, I've done visual effects since I got out of high school, actually before I got out of high school. And so it's just in my blood to do that. So I work with uh, the witnesses, the one the people have had the experiences and they give me drawings or they describe it to me. And I go into three dimensional space using Blender currently. I used to use Lightwave a lot um, and I create what they what they've seen. Uh, right now, uh, working with James, uh, he had drawings of what he experienced, and he, it was sort of a horseshoe-shaped UFO, um, boomerang-ish, but like a horseshoe. It, it had that same kind of shape to it, and he, he saw it really close up, so I was able to work from his description and create exactly what he saw and, and how he saw it. And so I've got a camera inside of a car from his perspective driving down the road, which is close by to where I live and um, the camera directs and looks out the window and, and he sees the object in the field and he's thinking, looking at it, what's it doing out there? I mean, if that's a UFO and it's come all this way, why is it just out there looking at a field? And then he turns to his, his girlfriend and says, hey, do you see that? And then right at that moment, he looks back and it's like it hurt him and it starts to come over. As he's driving 65 miles an hour down the freeway, the darn thing's coming right towards him. It comes right up to the side of the car like this and then comes around in front of it and going backwards down the highway at 65 matched to his speed, it's following him. Before it comes around to the other side and scares his girlfriend and then it shoots off over the hills. And then that's when he stopped. At least that's what he thought happened. That's what he remembered. But actually in between there, somewhere in there, they took him. And that's so classic. It's so typical. Um, so I'm recreating that sequence right now. And also there's another sequence where he um, was in a room and he saw what he described as praying mantis types. You've probably heard of this before. And they're all sitting at a table and looking at this holographic sphere that's showing the future of Earth. So I'm, I'm doing those scenes tonight. Um, I can't do everything I want to do because there's not enough time. I generally have about a week to edit one of these shows, which is not very much time. We'll shoot it on a Sunday. And then I have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday to cut it. I want to be done by <laughs> Thursday. So I have Friday if I see something I don't like. And then Saturday gets uploaded and goes on. We just make it by the hair of our chinny chin chin right now. So It's a lot of deadlines. better. Yeah, next week's better because we're running an old film I made in 1998 with Tony Hooper, who's the son of uh, Toby Hooper, the director of Poltergeist, one of his many movies that he did. He was a friend of mine, a sweet guy, he passed away a few years ago. And um, we did this film at uh, this house he got for his son, and we shot the film there. And it was about these experiences. And it, it, it was that was 1998. When you watch the film, and it's going to... Um, is it this weekend it's screening? No, it's the next weekend, a week from this Saturday. It's called The Visit. And you will see a real difference between that film and But Something Is There and um, The Dream Time and A Conversation With My Father. Um, you can see that evolution I've been talking about. So I think it's going to be... Um, a good refresher for the, for the community to see that film and they've never seen it. It's never been shown before. Wow. So that's going to be I, a had a, I found a DVD I had of it because I can't reach Tony anymore. And we're here from once in a while. He was going to get me the original edit. He never did. This has been going on for a couple of years. I finally gave up. I found this DVD. I had it up scaled or up resed um, by a friend of mine and it's not bad quality. And so finally people can see this film uh, and no one's seen it since 1998. That is so fabulous that you found that and you just figured yeah. it out and getting, yeah, it's your story, yeah. right? It's, it's, it's fun. It's a little spooky. It's, uh, 
it moves very quickly. The sound is not very good in the beginning because back in those days, even though we had a professional high eight camera, high eight wasn't very good, even if it was a professional expensive camera and the audio on it was only so good. We didn't have uh, lavaliers like we do today. Today I use very high end studio microphones that are these little black things that are hidden up here and the rest of it's hidden in the person's pocket or on their belt. And the, the quality of them is very, very good. I mean, those microphones alone cost more than the camera we used back then, you know. Wow. But then the rest of the film uh, doesn't have dialogue in it. So, you know, the audio's great. And it's just, you know, it's uh, I'm watching it and I say, yeah, the audio is so nasty. But it has this sort of dreamy feel to it. So it works. <laughs> and the rest of the film is so... Tony edited the film and he just did such a brilliant job. Like his father, he was this amazing filmmaker with so much talent. Um, and he really made that film into a great little movie. And I hadn't seen it in years. And when I watched it, I went, wow, this thing was pretty good. <laughs> Wonderful. So, and we yeah. get to see that. I'm really looking yeah. forward to that. Yeah, me too. It's fun to watch the comments down the side and see how people react to it. The main thing is, is when the premiere starts, you watch the comments, these people pop in there and they say, hello from, from Florida or hello from Canada or hello from UK. And, and they, and they are, they're starting to get to know each other. Mm. You know, they'll say, Hey, so-and-so and Hey, so-and-so. Hey. And then they start sharing things between each other. And they're all, they all talk about how happy they are to be there. And they look forward all week to this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that just, that's, 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 really makes it all worthwhile to, to see people happy because of something you're doing. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't get any better than that. It just, you know, yeah. I always sleep so well at night thinking that, you mm -hmm. know, that people look forward to it and that they enjoy it so much and it would make it very hard to ever stop doing it. Good. We don't, we don't want you to, to stop. Anyone. Yeah. That would be terrible. I think your show is the only show I watch now because you'll, you'll put out a coming out in four days. So I'll go notify me. And then it's like two days later, you'll go another two days. And you're thinking, this is taking forever <laughs> because yeah. you're, you're so looking forward to seeing it because everything you put out is excellent. It's just excellent. Thank you. It's excellent quality and it's all very. There's nothing sensationalized. It's just people just being themselves and sharing. And yeah, you're, I don't and want to sensationalize it. That's what Hollywood's done. I mean, yeah. I don't know if you ever, are you familiar with the Travis Walton story? Travis Walton, I'm sure I've seen it. And yeah, they he's kind of the, tortured uh, that, the right? Logger. He's a logger. Uh, and, uh, and he and his mates were coming back in the evening after a long day of working in the forest. And... Travis saw this UFO hovering over the trees and he, the car, they stopped the car and he got out and he went right up underneath it and he got hit by this beam of light and, and, um, knocked backwards and his friends freaked out and they took him and he was gone. And of course he was missing for, I forget how long it was. It was more than a day. As I recall, someone will correct me on it. They always do. But he was gone for a long time, long enough that the police took his friends in and questioned them. They thought that maybe there was something went on there. That maybe he, that they killed him or did something bad and they weren't telling the truth. Because they, they're telling them they saw this UFO. And, of course, the police are thinking, yeah, right. What happened to Travis? And then uh, he shows up on the side of a road and uh, bewildered and goes to a phone booth and calls into town and says that, you know, what's going on. And, you know, and they're all like, where have you been? And what he remembered was turned into a film. And, and what he remembered when he was on board this craft is he saw, well, he saw these guys. Right? And these hardly looked like, black-eyed aliens. I mean, they are the same sort of shape and everything, and but they don't have what I call the eye covers on them, mm. the black eyes. And But other than that, they look like grays, right okay. down to the color, that the sort of bluish skin. And the illustrations in the book are very clear at showing them. He also saw very normal-looking human beings with blonde hair on board the craft. 
He woke up on the table, came to. Um, three of these beings came in the room, saw him, were startled by him. He, he was startled by them. He picked up an object that was on the table and threatened them with it. They backed away. The uh, tall humanoids came. They took him down some corridors and stuff, and they took him into a room that was all black with a chair sitting in the middle of it. And as he approached the chair and they had him sit in it, he was literally floating in space. There was stars all around him, below him, above him, all around. And he found that he could move the craft by moving the controls on the, on the, uh, on the chair. He was also taken to like this huge hangar bay and he saw the craft that, that took him more than one sitting there. What happened in the movie is everything was the same up to the point where he got taken. And once in, inside there were the horrible lizardy looking ghoulish monsters and they they had them down a table and they had what we call dental dam it's a latex that stretched over him and smothering him and there was slime everywhere and 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 it was a nightmare mm. well they did that for the box office and i knew the writer of the screenplay uh tracy just passed away i mean just literally a couple of weeks ago um, and I was at a MUFON event and he was there and I asked him, I said, why did you change the, the whole being taken scene? Why did you make it into a horror film? And he said, this producers told him that if they saw those black eyed aliens one more time, they didn't have a picture. Now this is back in the nineties. In other words, they did not want what really happened. They wanted to sensationalize it. The very thing that you said, um, and he got really mad at me, you know, for bringing it up because he, it bothered him that he had to do that. But he did it to keep his job, which meant that he was kind of admitting he sold out. I wouldn't have done it. I would have no. went home and, and, and ate beans for a while because I just <laughs> won't do that. But he did. I understand it. I'm not mad at him. I, 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 but, you know, it's just that's what happens. They sensationalize stuff. And so hopefully I, I just caught rumor that, that Travis – who I'm going to try to get on our show is going to have an opportunity to have the film done again and this time the right way. Wow. But what I would like to do is get Travis on our show, have him go in front of our cameras here and let him tell his story. And I will work with him very closely and bring those illustrations in his book to life. What really happened to him. So uh, I just talked to Yvonne Smith, who's who knows him well. Uh, has contact with him. She gave me his email address. I'm going to write to him and hope that he responds because um, I want to see him have that chance. And we don't need to sensationalize this stuff. And so many of the other UFO channels do exactly that. And the thing that, that really bothers me is how if you don't see it the way I see it, then you're just stupid. And a lot of them have that attitude. One of our influences is a guy named AJ. He has a a uh, very, 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 very successful show on YouTube. He never meant it to be a successful show, but he's a very honest, wonderful, loving guy. And that's why he's so successful because he's got a charisma. He, he's got this personality and people love him because he's so honest. But he tells, he reviews all cases in paranormal and science. He goes through them and then he comments at the end. And if he's got it, he will debunk them sometimes. He will... He will find things that that um, conflict with the author's description of what happened or memory of what happened. A conflict with the person saying, well, I worked for, you know, a certain air defense contract. And they find out this person never worked for the for that that contractor. But always in closing, he says that we should always keep an open, open mind. We should never discount these people and we should actually applaud their coming forward to share this information. We don't know what they've been through. We don't know what they've been told. Maybe they did work for the contractor. Maybe they did cover it up and remove any tracing of it as they did with Bob Lazar. It's important to be kind, important to listen. And and I love the way he always closes that way. It's He's, he's just such a great guy. And the, the, the show is called The Y Files. He has a big red dot with a W and a Y. He's a very entertaining guy. And, and behind him, as he sits down, he always lowers into his seat like this, <laughs> the beginning of, uh, with the sound of, an, of like a motor. And he starts the Y files. He's got this set. And there's a little picture of Art Bell back there and aliens and things all on the wall. 
Brilliant. And a, a, a fishbowl with a fish in it, a goldfish that talks. It's, it's called Cracklefish. <laughs> it makes jokes all the time. But the show is very serious. He's a very serious guy about this stuff. And um, I can't get anybody to watch it. But despite that, that I know to watch the Y Files. But I always look forward to him every week. I can't wait to see, you know, and I, and I, Mary and I were talking about that and saying, it's a wonderful thing. And we could do this with the subject matter. It was Mary's idea to start the channel. So AJ is now at almost 4 million subscribers. Wow. Within a couple of days, one of his shows will get 6 million views. Wow. And the only reason you can do it is because people love him so much, they, they support him. They, they're throwing money at him all the time for his hard work, and he works himself to the bone. But he also managed to get a nice big building in Las Vegas. He's got a nice big studio. He's really evolving what he's doing. And I can't uh, imagine a nicer person to happen to. He's, um, I'm sure he's been offered to be bought out or picked up by, by big business, by big media. But he's the type that would turn him down. And I would do the same thing. And I will do the same thing. If this breaking the silence even gets close to having the popularity that the Y Files had, it will always stay personal, always stay for that community. Because really, what makes breaking the silence are the people who love it, the people that support it in that community. This is their show, this is every bit as much as it's ours so it's um as several people call it, it's a movement <laughs> it's a okay movement. it's a movement <laughs> but if it's a movement towards peace and love i'm all for it so yeah it is a movement towards peace and love because imagine as you would know people who have never spoke or um, it's your images it's when you worked with yvonne and you took all the regressions that she's done and made art based on people what they're what they were experiencing you created so many because you put that a lot at the front of your videos which i love to watch even my daughter was with her boyfriend and i said listen before you go out just just give me like seven minutes just watch this art and he's like stoned so he's going like what is that? I was like, well, that's the ab <laughs> abductions, you know? And he goes like, wow, is that real? I was like, yeah, it's very real. And my daughter's going, wow, mom. Like it, they're, it's just, and they're just kids, you know, they're like 17. And wow. it, it makes it, it's like real. It's not Hollywood. It's not Netflix. It's, it's actually real artists, real experiencers and real witnesses coming together to say, look, look, yeah, it's really important. So I have no doubt that you will um, resonate what it is you're seeking there to reach out because it's already taken uh, taken off completely, right? It's just it, it's doing it's doing fairly well. It's it's uh, slowed down a little bit. Um, you know, initially when we first came on, I mean, within three days we had like 150 thousand views on Daphne's video, but I think a lot of that had to do with we were new and people were checking us out and they wanted to see how we were different. And things like this always take more time because um, we don't have uh, the funds to get this to a broader audience. And when I say a broader audience, I don't mean the general public so much. There are, for all 300 and something thousand views that we've had so far and the, for the almost 7,000 subscribers we have, which we got very quickly, there are several thousand more of the same people who don't know about us at all. Yeah. I mean, people that, that love this subject matter, that have an affinity for it, that have the experience themselves, that community. So it will take time the way we're doing it. And Whitley Strieber has been helping a lot to spread it so that other people find it. So I, I'm pretty sh certain that it will continue to grow. Yeah. This Saturday is going to be really interesting because, uh, James is such a an interesting person. He just really, I mean, I don't think anybody's ever seen anyone like James before talk about this subject the way he does. He's quite a personality, quite a character. I, I think he's 36 or 38 years old. He has uh, a newborn and a two-year-old. He teaches surfing for a living. And he's uh, a very intellectual 
well read. He, he really educates himself. He, about, he says, I want to know everything about about the cosmos and space. And I read all Stephen Hawking's books and stuff, you know. Um, and he uses terms like gnarly, you know. <laughs> it was a gnarly way, but it was, that guy was gnarly. And I remember when he, he and he's talking about his step grandfather, he, or his stepfather. He said he was a gnarly right wing monster. That's how I describe him. <laughs> he always had guns around, and he treated me terribly. And and so, if we have any of those people watching the show, they'll be long gone after Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> You have to have empathy for them too, because there's a reason that they're the way they are. Yeah. And um, someone the other day said, we're talking about their experience. And they said that the visitors said to them, when you're born and your children, you're perfect. You're absolutely perfect. And then over time, you're not raised right. You're, you're exposed to anger and hate and all these things and you're told to grow up and then you're not perfect anymore and then you're making the world that you have that we need to go back to that inner child none of us can remain perfect none of us can be perfect but we could be a lot better than we are yeah. um, and it all goes back to that i mean i hear people all the time say to me you know i i, I race slot cars still my dad and i used to race them all the time and and uh he raced cars and I raced cars when I was younger. I had Spitfires and Triumph, Triumphs and MGs and Alfa Romeos. And I still have one. I have a an Italian sports car that I take out once in a while and I just love it. But it was just in our blood. And, and people would say to me, you know, you play with slot cars still? And I wish I could do that. Well, what's stopping you? Or, oh, you fly those model airplanes? Oh, you know... I've always wanted to do that, but you know, I, I, I have to work and this and that. And no, no, no. They moan and moan and moan. It's like they're not allowing themselves to go back to the inner child to take joy. And then there's all the people that watch me build models because I, for a long time on, um, on YouTube, I did a lot of shows about building models. I built the USS Enterprise from Star Trek and all these other things. And I showed you step by step how I created all the parts individually, made the molds. People loved that. And they would say, oh, God, I've always wanted to do that. And then they'd start doing it. They'd say, hey, you know what? I'm going to do that. And then some time later it goes by and they, they thank me because they feel free now. They, they, they come home from work and they can go in the garage and they can work on that thing they have a passion for. And it's that little child saying, let's build that spaceship. And, and they're back in connection with that. And you watch them totally change. Yeah. So maybe the job they have they don't like so much isn't so bad anymore because it affords them to be able to entertain their inner child. And they can build that model car, or that model plane, or build a railroad set and connect with other people that do that. And all of a sudden, they start to act like little kids again. Yeah. Do what feels good, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do do what feels nice, do what feels good. Like for you, it's yeah. making movies and art and creativity, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And driving And cars. I still love flying. <laughs> and you made a, one of your releases recently was about a conversation with your dad. Yes. And you're talking about cars. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, not everything in that movie is, is accurate to what happened to my dad and I, but uh, my dad uh, passed away when I was only 14 years old, ironically, in a, in a car car crash that wasn't his fault i mean he wasn't racing he was going to work he was doing um work on uh, government nuclear submarines at mare island and it, it was a treacherous drive out there because of the fog and stuff and unfortunately some drunk driver that the highway patrol was chasing was driving down the wrong side of the road and he drove off a bridge mm. uh, when i was 14 but and that was you know that was just awful uh, but my dad and I shared a passion for building models. He was an incredible artist. Mm. He was like a human camera. He would look wow. at your face and just draw it perfectly. Okay. And charcoal. And he, um, and he loved slot cars. You know, we, we built cars together and take to the tracks and race and just have all this fun. And, um, and it's just always stayed with me. Never, never let it go. 
So. And when you made the the short film about that, when you communicate with your dad, how do you do that? Does he show up? Is it in a dream? Like, how do, how does that work for you? Well, what this what it's based on, it's somewhat fictionalized, but what it's based on is lots of stories I've heard. But I personally experienced had personal experience with that more than once. But the one that really stands out, the strongest, was in nineteen seventy. at nine or eight, right around in there. I'd worked on this film with Roger Corman called Battle Beyond the Stars. And um, I had this girl friend named Judy. She was 24. I was a little older than her, a couple years. And I had a premiere the next day. And that night, she didn't spend the night at the house. She stayed at a girlfriend's house. And that morning... Before the premiere, about six o'clock or so, right in there, I had this powerful dream. I mean, it was just really powerful. I, I uh, found myself floating in free fall. I was in a sphere of, of, of like clouds. It was like it was a, a sphere. It wasn't like the clouds came all the way. It was like an edge to it. And they were colored lights moving through them. And there was an ambient music and sounding in the background. It was very cliché. It was a very sort of new age type experience. And Judy comes out of this fog and clouds towards me. And she she always um, joked with me about my interest in UFOs and life after death and all these things. And she was desperate to tell me that I was right about all those things and how much she loved me and that she had to go. But not to worry about her. She says, I feel incredible. You can't imagine what this is like. And, and I love you so much, but I have to go. And she hugged me and then she backed away and she just disappeared. Um, as she disappeared, I noticed she didn't have any clothes on except for a pair of, of panties, which was bizarre. And I remember waking up in the dream going, what was that? And I was you know, young, I was in a rush, I had to go see my movie, and, and I was all full of myself. I did all these cool aliens for it and stuff, and so I went down there to see it. And when I got back home, there were all these messages on the machine that she had died during the night. Wow. And when I looked into it further, she died around that time. And um, then I was called in by the detectives because they thought there might have been foul play at the house where she spent the night with her girlfriend, it was this guy's house that I knew. And um, so they had me in for questioning. And then the detective told me how she was found. She was found in her panties on the floor. She, and she was all beat up. Well, you know, it was evidently it turned out later that uh, the paramedics were trying to revive her. She had a brain aneurysm at 24. And that's when I remembered that dream. And I said, oh, my God, there's just no way there's any coincidence there whatsoever. Because I had no idea that she was going to die. None of us did, let alone know how she was found. I knew how I knew what, what I saw, but to be told that she was found that way. Uh, I was sick for two, three weeks afterwards, deathly ill. And I never found out what from. It was wow. like food poisoning, but it wasn't food poisoning. I just, I don't know if it had to do with the fact that she pulled me out of my body, and, and which is what she probably did. But the funny thing about it is um, I sensed, going back, thinking about it now, I sensed that there was someone else there when that happened. Okay. And I, I have a feeling it was the visitors or that intelligence because there's a deep connection between those things. So, and then I'd have dreams about being with my dad on a park bench and talking. So with all that experience, I thought it would be, I wanted to, to do a story about that. And I wanted to do uh, show how families would discount you for having experiences that they don't understand that that makes them afraid. Um, and I wanted to have some justice at the end of that story. That's why, you know, uh, why the brother was hiding in the bushes all the time. In fact, there's a point where David, that's the actor, we work with him all the time. He's a wonderful friend. You'll see, I think he'll come around. And he's staring right at the camera. And, and that's because he's seeing him. He, he sees him there. And uh, 
And it's a bit like Twilight Zone at the end, but I love the Twilight Zone. I love Rod Sterling. What a wonderful human being he was. So, so that was really the, the motivation for doing that film. My experience that I had with that. My mother also, um, when she was a little girl, uh, woke up in the night and her grandmother was sitting on the edge of the bed and, and I'll never forget this. And she's same thing. I love you so much and I have to leave and everything's going to be fine, but I had to come by and say goodbye. So she leaves. And the next thing my mom knows is she's being woken up by a phone ringing. It was in the hallway and it was my grandmother, her mother answering the phone. Because back in those days, phones were on a very short cord in the hallway. Yeah. And she's on the phone, and then she hears her break down and start crying. And she comes in, and she says, your grandmother just died. So, and, and this is on my, my, my mother's side of the family. So on both sides of the family, we had these things. Um, my grandfather telling me on my father's side, he talked to the past on, you know. So that's why I did that film. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's important too. Yeah. The other one, the dream time that was based on another, I had a dream and I woke up in this very strange setting and, and there was somebody sitting next to me and I looked and I saw a swastika and I looked again and it was Hitler. Wow. And he was full of remorse and he was trying to tell me that, 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 that he's not the same person that I think he is. And it all had to do with parallel realities. And in fact, in another parallel, Hitler was not a monster. His parents weren't unkind to him. They didn't raise him and beat him and all those things. And and um, and he was this wonderful person. And it, funny enough, I expected to really be beat up on that one. Yeah. By various communities. And I only had a few emails and uh, comments about it. And they were all very constructive and very kind how they put it, but they didn't quite buy it. That's fine. Mm. You know, I mean, I, I'm not bothered. People are entitled to their opinion. You don't have to be mean about it, you know, and they weren't. And that was it. Everyone else liked the film. And I really, I really was worried, you know, oh my God, they're gonna. Yeah, because it was unusual. Yeah, it's unusual because you're in your dream, and it looks like a spaceship, but you're in a dream, and there's a man there, but the man is Hitler. So you have this kind of very <laughs> nice conversation. You're thinking, "Wow, this is so unusual." And, yeah, and there's there's um compassion there. Yeah, the way he keeps changing he, each time you look at him again. The armbands off. Then he's wearing. Then the ties off. Then he's wearing a different clothing and then the mustache is gone and you know he starts looking really healthy and it's just um that was actually someone else's idea when i was working on the script because i'm always open to the crew's input always i learned that from kubrick he says always keep your mind open to every single person on the crew no matter where level he is on that crew they nice. may have an idea that you overlooked and that's extremely important and so i always work that way and um i was told that that might be a neat thing to do. And I immediately said, you're right. That's brilliant. You know? So we have a good crew, all friends, all people we've worked with before. The people that work on my films, a lot of them, uh, especially in those three films, we uh, all work together in Hollywood. A lot They've of many come. movies for many years. The visitors so. are back. Yeah. Is that them? Can I ask a question? If, if somebody's watching and they have, what advice would you give to somebody who's had their own experience and because you've gone through your life, your whole life having visits and different experiences, even in the dreams and going through walls and on spaceships and understandings. Yeah. And when you when you get to a certain point, is there a point of surrender into that? A point of just going, it is is there a point where you just surrender or where you lose any fear or is there a point for people who might not be where you are? The fear goes, it's gone. It's like, and here's, here's our, our latest guy, he's 36 years old, uh, James, that you're going to see Saturday. I remember when he came over here to talk to us, we interviewed him and, and Mary said, sounds like you went through a lot of fear. How do you feel today? And he says, what's there to fear? And you sort of realize at some point, hey, I'm not afraid anymore. And this is part of my life. This is part of my reality. It always has been. And so it's okay 
So just move on and, and live your life. This is part of your life and it's quite natural and it's not really, I mean, when you first discover it, you're like Richard Dreyfus. You want to build devil's tower in your living room. You want to tell everybody about it. You know, in, 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 it's like you want to, you obsess, <laughs> you know, because my God, I, I, I just thought I was seeing UFOs. I didn't know I was involved. This is amazing. And, um, uh, but that settles down. And, and then you start to realize after years that it's quite natural. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, I don't have any problem with it anymore. And being in that space when, because in the movie communion and he's all freaked out in the beginning and he's scared and he's mm -hmm. traumatized, but then at the end, he's just dancing with them. He's like, Hey guys. And they're smiling. Yeah. And is there a point where the kind of game changes when you come to that point? Yeah. Yeah, there is. I, you know, well, we're going to uh, have Whitley back again and uh, we want him to talk about his book, The Key, which is a great book. If you've never read it, it's, it's one of his shorter books. It's a short little paperback. It's not very long. And I think it's probably one, one of the best. And that's at that point where he's definitely okay with it, you know, and this was years ago. And with this little man, he's in a hotel at a conference and this little little guy knocks on his door and comes in and they have this long existential conversation. And he's mm -hmm. one of the visitors, but he looks like a little man, right. strange little man. And, and I had one of those people in my backyard when I was growing up. His name was uh, Mr. Lee. He was our gardener. And my mother says we never had a gardener, but we did. Uh, well, at least I remember him clearly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't change a thing. I'm grateful to the experience because um, I have this connection and I have this awareness of, of, of things that I, I would never have without it. And it's enriched my being and my soul. I think if this intelligence had not meant for that to happen, it never would have. If it was... People are always saying that they have evil intention. They're out for themselves. They just want our DNA. There's all these conspiracies and all these negative things said about it because people who don't understand are quite threatened by it. And they're still in that mode of being threatened by it. They, 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 um, it's the animal. It's, it's you're defending yourself. And um, but given time, you start to settle down a bit and you start to pay attention more to what's going on. And you say, wait a minute. They're trying to teach me something. And I think that's that turning point. And when you first start to realize that that you're being taught, it's like, okay, I'm going to stick with this school because I can't get out of it, obviously. <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> so um, I'm going to stick with the school and, and see where it leads to. And where it's led to is, oh, man, I, I feel more at peace with myself today than I ever have in my entire life. Mm, beautiful. You know? I'm glad I wish I could have been at this level when I was in my twenties, you know, it would be, it would have been amazing, but, yeah. and, and I think it is possible for human beings to be at this level at any age. And if they were, and when they do reach that point, that's another point of evolution where the world starts to be truly a better place than it is. I'm not saying it's a bad place right now, I try not to watch the news, but I try to focus on the good people and the good things that are happening. And it's still a good world. It's still a beautiful world, but it could be better. Yeah. And it's up to us. And I think that's what they're trying to teach us. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Because this is, um, you're taking the fear out. Because if we've grown up watching those scary movies, alien movies, and someone talks about aliens, you just go back to the filing cabinet of the movie. But when we see your your movies and the stories of your guests, it's like, that's not what it's like in the movies. That The real story's not. That's different. And then you can say that you have so much peace and understanding and it's part of who you are and the grace, the grace you have with that and the strength as well. It just It's just helping me even understand. And if it's helping me, it's going to help everybody else who listens to what you're doing. And so I'll put all your links in the boxes and I'm going to share some of your images. Would I be allowed to share some of your images at the end of this so people can follow on to you? 
uh, how would I do that? Uh, oh, I can do it right there. I see. I didn't even, I didn't even notice that. Yeah, or yeah, just um, look at your camera compared to mine. I need to go to America to get a decent camera. <laughs> you don't need to go to America. You can just uh, order it on Amazon. It's called a, a razor. A razor. I'm going to get an a razor. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a great camera. It's, a, it's the name of it. And um, uh, how can I share a link? I can. Sh oh boy, that would be hard to do right now. You don't have to do that right now. I'll share all okay. your links in the description below. I want to say thank you for coming onto my show and talking to the audience who plugs into me because they're really excited about um, this topic because it's not ever spoke about in Ireland. Yeah, that's yeah. fascinating to me. I mean. Mm -hmm. There's so much folklore and so much mystery and so many tales of of otherworldly beings in Ireland. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if it's really something that the people there are uncomfortable with because it, it you know, because the, the stigma that goes with believing in such things, um, and the Irish have a reputation for it. I mean, for you know, the leprechaun is, you know, yeah. for, for one thing, and but. Um, I don't see anything wrong with it. I think it's, uh, I would love to go to Ireland. I'd love to spend time there. Um, I remember seeing Darby O'Gill and Little People for the first time. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Have you ever seen Darby O'Gill and the Little People? Darby? It's a great movie. It's I, a Disney movie. I can't say. And it's say. all about the banshee and the, the leprechauns and everything. And that, that film just captivated me when I was a child. So Brilliant. And, and, and Darby looks like my grandfather. So it was that too. So I'll check it out. Thanks again yeah. for coming on. And uh, thank you. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll be in touch for sure. I'll be in touch. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Please stay in touch. Yeah, I will. And I'm excited for um, th this next story out on Saturday. So thanks for coming on. We'll speak again soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.